Welcome, everybody. Joe Tarnowski with ECRM, and I have with me today Rebecca Stein, who is the founder of Blind Tiger Spirit Free Cocktails. And uh, she's a regular ECRM session participant, as well as a Range Me Premium member. So, um, Rebecca, thank you so much for joining us. I want to get into this topic of non-alcoholic adult beverages, because I know it's, a, it's a, a very big trend right now. So can you tell us a little bit about Blind Tiger and also your history as a restaurant operator? Because that's kind of where this all started, right? Yeah, absolutely. And by the way, thanks for having me today, too. <laughs> so um, I actually launched a speakeasy style restaurant called Room 33 back in 2017. So we're going on our fifth year now. And um, it's the classic speakeasy style, has like a little bookshop entrance. You go through a bookcase to get into the restaurant and it's full service. And it's been a really exciting and amazing venture and the team has been wonderful. But fast forward um, from there, obviously we all know the challenges that came with the, the pandemic. Um, and in March of 2020, because of that, all restaurants, I'm pretty sure most of us across the country were mandated either to close or to take out only. And at the time, our, our restaurant is in Pennsylvania. So at the time, 90% of our sales were bar sales. And we either, we had to, and I know everybody uses this word, but we had to pivot and adapt or we had to close up shop. Mm -hmm. So we ramped up our menu. And today, actually, we have 60% um, bar and 40% food. So we actually really did well by, by taking on that element of it. But one of the things we did differently was we started bottling non-alcoholic versions of our cocktails to go, and we had an amazing response. So I started doing a ton of research in the market and having had a restaurant and having been to, to many other speakeasies and such around the country, I learned that there weren't a ton of options, at least at, at that time, for those who didn't drink for whatever reason. And um, I thought it would be interesting to kind of see how it would do. And um, the, it was just at that like precipice, I think, where it really started to take off, you know? So we're in 2020, there's a, everybody's at home, they're, not, they're drinking a lot, but then they're like, okay, maybe I shouldn't be doing so much because they're not leaving. So they start getting more into this healthier lifestyle or searching for it. And, and then um, it had such a high growth rate, like in 2019, it had a 506% compound annual growth rate, the non-alcoholic market. It was, it was amazing. I applied for a major grant through um, what's called Ben Franklin Technology Partners here. They support manufacturers and or technology components. And I ended up winning the, the, the grand prize for it, which helped me kind of launch the product commercially. So through this, like I went to the team, we created four recipes of classic prohibition style cocktails. I went, worked with a beverage engineer to help create them so that they were shelf stable while focusing on keeping more like all natural type ingredients. So, um, and then it's just been a process getting them out into the stratosphere. So just for, um, just to explain room 33, the name is it's named after the end of prohibition, which was 1933. So the design of the restaurant is to be a marriage of pre and post prohibition. And then Blind Tiger and carrying our brand along is what speakeasies were called during the prohibition era. I had no idea that uh, they were called Blind Tigers. Yeah, they're Blind Tigers or Blind Pigs. And the reason for that is um, places that were serving illicit alcohol would put stuffed tigers or stuffed pigs in their windows to, to in the the police were blind to it. Supposedly, they didn't know what was going on, but they probably did. Oh, well, yeah, they were paid off. And yeah. <laughs> they were just like, okay, I'll let them go. <laughs> yeah. So can you take us through your product lineup and, and tell us what, you know, how you're kind of mimicking the flavor or the, the, the feeling of an alcoholic beverage? Sure. So we currently have four SKUs, the Bee's Knees, Southside, Sidecar, and Ward 8. And just so you know, these are all actual classic cocktails that were designed in pre or post prohibition. So it was nothing that we recreated or reinvented. Um, but what we did is we wanted to add uh, the flavor profiles of the spirit to each of them. So the bee's knees is typically made with a honey syrup, lemon, and gin. And instead of gin, we ended up using a juniper flavor um, to kind of give it a little bit of, to mimic that spirit flavor a little bit. And the south side is also made with gin. And it's funny when you look at prohibition cocktails, 
there wasn't a lot of vodka. Like, I don't know if vodka was just not there or accessible, but gin, what, you know, bathtub gin, Mm -hmm. that was the big popular spirit back during prohibition. So that's why it's a little heavier in that arena. And then the sidecar, which was actually created over in Paris, um, that uses a cognac base to it. So we ended up using a little bit of brandy flavor, some bitters, and then we use an orange lemon to kind of recreate that. The Ward 8 is generally made with whiskey or bourbon. So we used a li- we actually created a natural flavor with a company that we work with to kind of give it a little bit of that smoky taste uh, and then get the, a little bit of the bite that you can get. But that's really hard to replicate, which, you know, we've seen in a lot of different spirit companies, NA spirit companies that are emerging today. And then the last one, uh, or did I cover all of them? I think I covered all of them, but the South Side which was supposedly Al Capone's favorite drink, was also mint, lime, and, and juniper. So we it had gin, so we replaced it with the juniper instead. So they're all completely different flavor profiles. Two of them are very light. One is smoky and one citrusy. Awesome. Now, since you are on both sides of the bar, <laughs> uh, yes. as, as an operator and a brand owner, uh, what have you seen as far as consumers of non-alcoholic beverages. What trends are you seeing? What types of people are getting into them? Because I know it's not, you know, it used to be in the past, there would be people that maybe were uh, sober and they're drinking, they're limited in what they have. But now it's also people who drink alcoholic beverages are also getting into non-alcoholic adult beverages as well from a health standpoint. What have you been seeing as a restaurant operator uh, among your patrons? Yeah, I think that, and I'm I'm one of those people, by the way, like I still love a good spirit. I love a nice glass of wine, um, but I also kind of have taken notice over the last couple of years as more um, drinks that are more natural or functional or better for you have been emerging in the market. People tend to start going towards those just for health reasons. And I mm-hmm. think that That demographic tends to be, at least statistically at this point, more like Generation X and and Millennials. Um, But I do think it it serves a a wide variety of people. We have both, we have a non-alcoholic part on our menu and it continues to grow over time. Like people really want, it's just really nice to have something to complement that, right? You want to go out and have a cocktail, but you don't want to wake up feeling terrible the next Mm day. So you start out with one and then you, then you switch to a non-alc, which still gives you the feeling of Mm -hmm. having, you know, a cocktail beverage, but it's definitely a huge growing trend. Um, Just seeing all these different companies come out and then the non-alcoholic, the ANBA that just popped up, um, the association that is, you know, dedicated to it. It's really a growing arena. Yeah. And, and I see a lot of people, I listen to a lot of wellness related podcasts and read a lot of different, uh, uh, books and studies and and you know a lot of people that are getting into the wellness space they're on some sort of a wellness journey a lot of times they will cut out the alcohol as well just as part of it or they'll limit it a lot uh yeah. just because it's you know there are studies saying okay it's bad if you drink later if you have a few drinks it's going to disturb your sleep and then your sleep is so yeah. critical for immunity for health and you know uh, all of these other benefits. So uh, more and more people are starting to do that. And the idea of mixing. So you're having a have maybe start off with an alcoholic beverage, then you switch later on so that you can kind of taper off. Are they, are, you know, because during COVID, I think you mentioned on your website that oh, in your area, you couldn't do delivery with alcoholic beverages. Who, do people buy your products to use them as mixers too? They do. Yeah. And actually the, one of the driving, it, it's made it a little bit confusing in the marketing and branding of the product, right? Like, are you NA or are you mixer? And I, I mean, really the argument is I, I believe we're both. Like, mm-hmm. I think they're refreshing. They're not syrupy like your typical mixer is. They're mm-hmm. good alone. But because we use the natural flavors of the spirit, if you add the original spirit to the cocktail, it only enhances the flavor profile of it. Mm-hmm. So how do you market Blind Tiger to these two different groups of people? You'll ha- so you'll have people that are just non-alcoholic 
uh, yeah. adult beverages, but how are you also marketing to people that typically drink alcoholic beverages? Yep, that's that's actually been a challenge for us, especially at the beginning. But one of the, we worked with a company and we came up with this tagline, which is prohibition and sport, prohibition inspired pours made for the modern drinker. Essentially, Blind Tiger are all natural, you know, bar quality products that are ready to sip or mix. So we use that all kind of concisely. And what we do is we promote to differentiate us. We promote the type of brand we are. We're back in the roaring 20s. It's the prohibition style where, you, you know, they're all the classic cocktails. And we let people know, you know, they're really nice for either because sometimes, especially in home situations, you have drinkers and non-drinkers. Mm-hmm. So now people can kind of ha- enjoy the same beverage without, you know, compromising one thing or another. I like that, a uh, sip or mix. That's yeah. that's pretty cool because again, it does, it hits everything and it's very quick, very, very snappy. So how, how did you, you decided on these flavors because they were traditional speakeasy kind of flavors and, and, and that's your, your background. Are you looking to add more to the mix down the road? Or- Yeah, I would love to create more of a line. Um, Right now, we're trying to see which ones emerge. You know, Mm -hmm. we've been in operation a little over a year. It's funny, too, because we originally had a line of five before we went to production. And the fifth one was the Bacardi, but the Bacardi is trademarked. So Bacardi is only like one of five cocktails that are actually trademarked. Uh, Like the Painkiller is one of them. The Dark and Stormy is one of them. So it was really interesting to kind of see that background in history. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we're working on a couple other ones right now behind the scenes and trying to see if it's something we'll add or we'll replace one out and just kind of see how it goes. Great. Now, what what type of venues do you think um, both because you can cater to both food service or, you know, restaurants mm-hmm. as well as retail on the restaurant or bar side, what kind of venues would be ideal for these? Yeah, well, I'm definitely not going after the very, you know, the really true classic speakeasy style ones, right? Mm-hmm. You know, because they like to use their very particular all natural ingredients mm-hmm. and they're very, you know, which I understand, but I do think from we have it in two sizes right now we have 16 ounce and a 32 ounce and the 32 ounce really lends itself more to um to to bars and restaurants to Mm -hmm. on-premise and uh it's nice because it makes a really quick easy cocktail it's like a two to one ratio and i think it does well in places that don't necessarily have an extensive cocktail list but would like to add a couple of different options to their menu like Mm -hmm. i don't see us um you know, at the at the corner pub, you know, we're typically beer or just spirits or mixed drinks. But I think that there is a variety of different places. Uh, case in point, when um, we had when you had ECRM had the on and off premise uh, event last fall, I think it was. Mm-hmm. I had a ton of restaurants interested in this type of product. They were looking for even larger options than what I had carried. So that's kind of still in process, but I, I know that there's definitely uh, an area for it. Great. Awesome. And I have seen, because I've been doing the Nielsen presentation with, you know, we, uh, me and Nielsen have been presenting at the past two or three uh, of our on and off premise adult beverage. And one of the things each year where they bring up non-alcoholic adult beverages you see the list getting bigger and bigger and bigger of of like samples that they show on the slide and it's just it's been trending it just keeps growing low abv and uh yeah. no abv is yeah. just you know the, it's been constantly growing along in in parallel with the whole wellness trends so uh but it's nice that you added you know a lot of a classy very cool delicious option because i've just full disclosure, I've tried these. They are delicious. <laughs> uh, I brought them to a uh, local restaurant uh, that I always go to, and we all sampled it. So, uh, um, you know, the packaging is beautiful. And, uh, you know, so it, it, it's well suited for places like that. So now you've been to, like you mentioned, you've been to um, several of ECRM sessions, uh, mm-hmm. as well as our global market. Uh, can you talk a little bit about your experience just in in using the platform and, and just uh, meeting with the buyers? How do you prepare for them? How, how do you get ready for these things as well? So, I, you know, it's been interesting. First of all, it's been an incredible asset uh, to have launched during, you know, 
a pandemic. Mm -hmm. And my experience up to date is, as I previously mentioned, has been strictly virtual. Mm -hmm. So, but the opportunities are so much more present today, especially in the virtual arena. So um, I have made so many great connections. Uh, some of them are still in progress. You know, some of them didn't work out, but I love that I now know who these people are, what they're doing, what's emerging, what their trends are. And um, I, I mean, I can't wait to do it again. So it's been a great experience so far. Awesome. How do you prepare? Uh, because oh, yeah. you do get the list of appointments ahead of time. So you know yes. who you're going to meet with. So what, how do you prepare for your, your buyer meetings and what kind of presentation? Like, how do you actually execute the presentation? How many slides? How much data? How much uh, do you leave for Q&A and all that? Yeah, yeah. Um, so obviously we all have pitch decks and we all have variations of our own pitch decks. But one of the big things that I do in preparation is learn who my who the potential buyer is, right? Is it really a fit for our product? And, and how is it a fit? Like, is it the NA scene? Is it a mixer? What do I think would serve them best? And then I focus on that because I think that's one of the things that I don't know how if everybody does this, but just to know kind of culturally, historically, who they are, why it's important that we're part of it. The relationship aspect is really integral to me. And then um, even from a slide perspective, you know, oftentimes when I am meeting with the, with the buyers virtually, I'm not going through the deck, right? Like I'm maybe picking a few slides here and there, or I'm just telling them, you know, here is the attachment. I'm gonna send you a hard copy of this with, my, with samples of the product. Please review it and ask me any questions, but let's have a conversation and see where this really fits best. Okay, so you, you try to be more conversational and, and really uh, put it in the perspective of the individual buyer who you're meeting with. Yes, yes. That's and great. I know I, that. No, oh, go ahead. No, and I know that it's different on and off premise, right? Mm -hmm. But when you're talking to restaurant and bar owners, it's fundamentally different than when you're talking to distributors or retailers, right? So they're all looking for different things and you're just kind of trying to figure out what appeals where. Actually, that's a good point. How are they different? Like, how is it different when you're talking to a restaurant operator? Because you've you've met with buyers from all of those different uh, areas. So how do you approach each differently? Yeah. So from a retailer standpoint, obviously, I want them to be able this is this is still an emerging market. Right. And one of the things that I know has been challenging for retailers is where does this go if um, they're not able to sell spirits? or they can just sell wine and beer. They typically wanna put it in the cocktail, like the mixer section. But I think one of the big advocates, like as an advocate for this, I think one of the things that retailers should continue to look at is creating actual areas that focus on non-alcoholic products alone. With us, it's nice because we can get mixed in the spirit section if there's spirits, but it's also like what's gonna move on the shelf, right? What area are we in? If I'm looking at Kentucky, or Tennessee, I'm going to focus a little more on the Ward 8 because it goes with bourbon and whiskey, right? And if I'm in a, in a different state, I'm going to see what, you know, variations, what you look at that stuff, the trends, the flavor profiles, what people are after. And then with restaurants, it's kind of like, how can I make the most money in the quickest amount of time, right? So it's kind of creating a consistent, efficient uh, cocktail, but also being able to turn it around in a higher volume setting in order for people to get a really good product but to get it quicker and easier. That's a great point, uh, especially on the restaurant side, because it's that turn that's going to generate the most money in the most, uh, the shortest amount of time. Yeah. So, uh, so that's great. Taking it from, you know, it seems you, you're really presenting with the view of how you're going to benefit the buyer in mind. Yes. So, yes. And you mentioned you're light on the slides. You focus more on conversation. Yeah. And I, and they get the whole deck, right. And I yeah. try to include as much information as possible, but I also know it's overwhelming. They only have, I, I've been told many, many times, you know, they only have like a few minutes. They're going to skim through it. What's, what's going to pick up. Is it, is it worth taking on? Is it trending? Can they sell it? Like those types of things. Mm -hmm. And you're right. And the meeting with, you know, it could be upwards of 30, 40, 50 people uh, in a week. So you want just the essentials and you want to just be engaging and memorable. Yeah. And I'm still learning. So just so you know. <laughs> yeah. So, well, we all are uh, constantly. If you're not yeah. still learning all the time, uh, you're doing something wrong. So mm -hmm. now you were recently uh, participating in our global market and you're one of the pioneers or, or I guess first one of the early 
uh, brands that is enabled for uh, direct purchasing on Range Me, and you've actually had a uh, purchase during the uh, global yeah. market. Uh, what was your? Can you tell us about the experience of of setting up the uh, direct purchasing capabilities, and uh, you know what was your experience with that? Yeah, to be honest, it was one of the easiest setups I've had in, in the various platforms that I've been trying to work with, right? There are some platforms that even today, although I have the opportunity to be on there, I haven't finished because it's just, there's so many details in the way that everything goes. With this one, it was super, it was super easy. Plus it connects to my range me profile, you know, so it allows, you know, the buyers to see, to, to be able to market everything, you know, and everything's already on there. So that was really nice. And I did get an order during the, during the global market, which was great. So I got an order of case of each from, from a retailer and um, yeah, so I'm excited to see. And I know that there's still other things in process on, on your end as things grow and develop. So I'm excited to see where, where it's going to go. Yeah. I know they have a, a bunch of new things coming down the pipeline that I can't talk about yet, but, yeah. <laughs> uh, but yes, the, uh, the direct purchasing functionality is going to include a lot more stuff as it goes. And we only just launched it in February, just before right. the global market. And uh, so that's why I'm glad that, so glad to hear that you've um, jumped right on it and already got an order. So, um, so yeah, so, You've been just working in a virtual world for the past few yes. years, uh, past couple of years. And, you know, so you don't have like an in-person thing to compare it with, or maybe you did, right. you've probably been to a few pre-pandemic, but what, you know, what is your view on virtual? How has virtual uh, helped you and where do you see it going down the road? Yeah, virtual has been amazing. I mean, I still love the in-person connection, you know, the opportunity to, to connect with people directly. And sometimes it comes better or, or, you know, it comes across better when you're in person, but the virtual option gives you accessibility that you wouldn't otherwise have because it's like, there's so much more time to be able to connect that way than there is in person. Like people's in-person meetings are very limited, especially as we get busier. And um, just the opportunity to, to meet so many of these people. And the really nice part is eventually, I hope to meet them in person. So I've already kind of set that precedent and it, it'll be great to kind of continue those relationships. Yeah, one of the things that uh, we've been hearing from buyers certainly is they're going to down the road, even, you know, as things open up, which they are doing, they're going to leverage virtual more for that first round of vetting of new yeah. vendors so that they can get the volume. They can meet as many brands as possible. Then as those relationships build and the conversations become a little more complex, that's when it'll, you know, existing customers or, or a more yeah. complex deal then they'll have the in-person. But for a, a brand, I mean, there's so many benefits as far as, one, there's cost savings. And then two, uh, you're, again, the volume of people that you'll be able to see a lot more quickly, whether it's on ECRM's platform or just doing your own uh, virtual meetings, it, you can cover a lot more ground, I would guess. Yeah, and the cost savings is a really, really good point, especially at the onset, right? And especially for startup and emerging brands that don't have a ton of capital behind them. It really has been able, like, it's one thing, you know, I've done booths at shows. They're like three to four times as much as it is to do a virtual, you know, engagement. So it's really, it's really been an asset. Yeah, especially if you're doing a booth at a show, it's a little different because, here you're getting your list of appointments and you're getting your appointments and they're coming yes. to you at a booth at a show it's there's no guarantee you're going to get appointments it's right. you know so you're you're making that investment sure you have that marketing value of having the booth but also when they come to it it's not always you know like there, we have our 5 10 and 20 minute meetings mm -hmm. somebody comes to your booth at a trade show it may be just for a couple of distracted minutes because everybody else is trying to get that buyer's attention too right exactly yeah so here you have dedicated time you know when it's virtual again whether it's with ecrm or if you're doing a zoom meeting on your own you have their dedicated time it's undistracted and and you could uh, uh and and geography location doesn't matter doesn't matter. Yeah, I, I mean, I was meeting with some global people back when in the on and off premise. So it's been it's been really interesting. 
So uh, do you have any plans to expand globally as well? Uh, not at this time. It doesn't mean I'm not open to it, but um, right now I'm just trying to get a hold on everything yeah. that we can do here. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I do hope to, if I'm ever in your neck of the woods, I do hope to check out room 33. It sounds oh, like yes. a really great place. So I will give you a heads up uh, next time I'm in your area. Please. And uh, yes, definitely. So, but great job with the brand and I wish you the best of luck. I look forward to seeing those orders grow. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Thank you.